Hello and welcome back. My name is Patrick Boyle and this is Applied Portfolio Management class number eight. So this is the last class in the series. This is the second one on the topic of hedge funds. I did a hedge funds class yesterday as well. And if you haven't watched that one, you probably should watch it before this one. Um, but anyhow, we're still on the topic of alternative investments and uh, we'll, alternative investments, broadly speaking, are made up of things like private equity, venture capital, hedge funds, commodity type investments, basically a type of investment that an investor may look to once they're already fully invested in stocks and bonds. Now, these are not suitable investments for an awful lot of investors, but for some people, they may find them interesting and they may add diversification to their portfolio. And so, as I showed in the prior two classes, actually, uh, this is the average asset allocation of a number of university endowment funds in the United States. And as you can see, they've probably got, I'd say, about a third of their allocation to alternatives, and about 22.4% of that is to hedge funds. So that's kind of why we're maybe spending more time on hedge funds than on some of the other alternatives that exist. And so today's strategies, the strategies we're going to look at are index arbitrage, merger arbitrage, and pairs trading. And as I mentioned yesterday, the term arbitrage is fairly loosely used in the world of finance. And, uh, you know, an arbitrage in the sort of strict definition means a risk-free profit. Um, you know, none of these strategies will actually be risk-free by any means, but uh, that's what they're called. Okay, so the first uh, the first hedge fund strategy we're going to take a quick look at, or alternative strategy, is index arbitrage. And so index arbitrage is quite an old trade, and in truth, it's a it's not a trade with a what would I say? It wouldn't really be a trade that has amazing returns associated with it, simply because it's maybe such an obvious trade, and there's a lot of people trying to do this. But the idea behind index arbitrage is to look at the price of things like futures on indexes and uh, to look then at the individual stocks that make up the index and essentially to try and find trading opportunities where there's a divergence between the price of the underlying stocks and the price of the, the index future that, that exists out there. And so the goal would be, if one moves up and the other moves down, your goal would be to sell the expensive one and buy the cheap one. And that's pretty much the sort of general rule of anything that uh, you know might be called an arbitrage trade. It's essentially a price spread that when it widens, you, you try and sell the expensive one and buy the cheap one. And so for example, things like the S&P 500 index. It's a big, well-known index that's out there. Uh, there's a futures contract on it. And the only real difference relates to the time value of money and dividends expectations on that index. Because of course, if you own a futures contract, you don't get the dividends while you do receive them if you own the underlying stock. So there's a few reasons for differences in price between an index and a derivative on that index. And uh, you have to obviously take those into account in looking for arbitrage opportunities. So how does it work? Well, traders basically track the value of the basket of 500 stocks that makes up the S&P, for example, and they'll track the price of the futures. And basically, whenever the, the price spread widens, they would want to sell the expensive one and buy the cheap one. Now, of course, transaction costs are going to play into this. It, it's not just, there are certain divergences that are reasonable, that can happen and should happen. Well, it's not necessarily that they should happen, but they're unarbitrageable. And the reason for that is quite simply that often the cost of trading, uh, commissions or spreads that might exist, uh, will be greater than the profit that you'd expect to make from a trade. So it's really only once a spread widens more than transaction costs that such a trade would be um, be attractive. So. 
what kind of things might happen to cause this? Well, for example, uh, you know, the original idea was that maybe, uh, you know, there's a big trader who's executing a big trade at the close of the day, either in the futures or in the individual stocks. And essentially that big trade is thrown into the market and moves one before it moves the other. And so an arbitrage trader would be stepping in and buying the cheap one, selling the expensive one, and that would push the prices together. And so it's actually just because of the existence of arbitrage traders that these things tend to move in line with each other. Because essentially, if these people weren't paying attention to it, uh, it would be possible for there to be divergences. But there tend not to be very noticeable divergences simply because it's as close to a risk-free trade as there is and thus uh, you know these traders are ready to go um, in order to trade uh, these spreads. So what kind of things can there be? Well there's a bunch of different sort of uh, index arbitrage type uh, strategies. Um, there can be an arbitrage between an index traded on two exchanges. That used to be a thing uh, many years ago. I mean once again it, it does sort of exist today, but like I said, the returns will be a lot smaller. But uh, often a given uh, index might trade on two different exchanges. And so once in a while, if there's a big trade on one and not on the other, a uh, spread might open up. Uh, there can be arbitrage between two indexes that have a standard relative value. So once in a while, you'll see certain indexes and they might have a large number of overlapping components. Now, that's not a pure arbitrage in that there are different components, but you would expect there to be a relationship between the prices of these two indexes. And so people might be trading one relative to the other in order to, uh, in order to try and extract a profit. Um, arbitrage between the various instruments that track the index. So it's not just necessarily futures and the underlying index. There's other things like ETFs, mutual funds, and so on that people will trade. And there you could even sort of group in with this type of trading, the idea of trading um, uh, closed end mutual funds that, that maybe trade at a discount to their NAV, a little bit like I talked about in, uh, in yesterday's video. In addition, there's other little games that people will play in this space, like trying to trade based around index ads and deletes. You know, the, the idea that if a new stock is being added to a widely followed index, that it might be expected to spike as all of the index funds have to buy that stock. And so people will trade around things like that. Um, so index ads and deletes are kind of almost a separate trade, but they're tied into this idea of index arbitrage. And so the strategy in, in general just involves buying the relatively lower price security, selling the relatively higher price security, and waiting until the prices converge, and that's when you exit with a profit. So once again, it's, it's a hedged trade in that if you bought one version of the index, sold another uh, security that's based upon that index, if the price, if the index rallies or if the index falls, you're not really profiting off of that. Your profit is just based around that spread narrowing. And so you would expect a strategy like this, once again, to have no correlation to the index that it's trading. And so uh, the value of a futures contract on any underlying is defined by this formula, which if you've uh, taken my futures and options course, you would know uh, this formula. And so you'll be paying attention to, uh, to the futures contracts, the underlying and seeing if a spread opens or closes. So um, essentially what you would expect, what should be expected is that the futures price will be moving up and down with the price of the underlying. Now there is a basis between the futures and the underlying and that's driven uh, by the differences that we've already explained. So it's kind of a time value of money difference and of course a dividends or any other uh, little differences like that between the futures and the underlying. And so should 
the price of one not track the other in this example we've got a, a, a the futures going up here while the underlying does not and so what you would be doing is you would be selling the futures contract buying the underlying 500 stocks and you would basically wait until they uh, converge again now it's worth noting that a lot of the people who trade this strategy they don't always trade the the future against the entire 500 stocks because uh, it may take a while and also it's more expensive to trade 500 stocks than a lower number and because these indexes are market cap weighted often they might just trade the largest components against the future now of course once again that does expose you to greater risk but the idea is that you're maybe able to trade a little bit more cheaply and so hopefully even though you're exposing yourself to greater risk your reduction in trading costs might uh, make the trade overall more profitable and equally it'll be quicker to execute a smaller basket of stocks and so um, many investors don't trade both futures and the underlying so this is even where these divergences would come from is there's certain people who only trade derivatives and there's other people who only trade single stocks and so often they don't necessarily look at each other they wouldn't be concerned with the fact that the future has gone up and the, the underlying stocks have not or vice versa and so other people are paying great attention to this and trying to extract a profit from it so these traders will be tracking the, the difference between these uh, underlyings and the futures or and the ETFs or any other related securities and trying to trade on that in order to generate a profit. Now, in the real world, traders aren't actually doing this. Maybe in the 1980s, that was the way it worked. But nowadays, of course, there are computers all set up to do this. So this is really uh, the world of high frequency traders today. It's not a, a suitable area for someone with a laptop computer and a, a piece of trading software, simply because this stuff moves so fast. And so an awful lot of, uh, of this will be done with uh, servers that are set up co-located at the exchanges with very fast uh, signals going between them and the exchange in order to extract this profit and it's worth noting I guess with with this kind of sort of pure arbitrage strategy that really the kind of people who can and will trade this are basically the people with the lowest cost of trading so essentially in the long run you would expect the return on a strategy like this to fall to about the risk-free rate simply because it's pretty much a risk-free trade and so the lowest cost trader will be doing it in order to extract these tiny profits and should the profits get any larger it would of course attract other traders so essentially it's not a very high return strategy but it is something that'll be done at investment banks or brokerage firms that have very good uh, connections to the exchanges and essentially it's almost a little bit of a side business that they'll do uh, that's tied to the fact that they already have these computers set up for other uses you know so that is really what index arbitrage is all about so we'll move on to our next strategy which is maybe a little bit more interesting and that is merger arbitrage so whenever one company buys another company that's a merger and whenever that happens there's often a trading opportunity that might exist in the market so let's take a look at this so we'll say, for example, if it's announced today that company A is buying company B, and we'll say if company A said they will pay $100 a share for company B, well, according to the efficient markets hypothesis, you would expect the price of company B to jump upwards pretty much to 100 but it won't go exactly to 100 and there's a few reasons for that. One is that there is still a time value of money component. So we'll say, for example, the merger may not close for three months, six months, who knows how long, it's usually announced, but the merger doesn't close the minute it's announced, it closes later. And so the price will jump up, but it can't go all the way to 100 because otherwise if someone bought it at 100, 
they'd end up holding if they bought the target company at 100 they'd end up holding it for three months before they got their 100 and of course that would be a, a loss making proposition so it will fall it'll rise up to a price below 100 now not only that there still is a, de a risk that the deal will break right because just because the deal has been announced doesn't mean that all of the analysis has been done and shareholders have agreed and so on and so the price will jump close to 100 but not to 100 taking into account the risk that the deal will break right because if the deal does break the price might fall all the way back down and thus um th thus uh, you're you're sort of risking this huge loss in return for sort of a small profit and so in our example here the target goes up by 30 percent but is still trading at a between one and three percent discount to the merger terms and that's reflecting the time value of money and the probability of the deal breaking so that is the core idea behind merger up now just to clarify this a lot of people misunderstand what i'm saying this is the price wiggling around as normal before the deal was announced you do not capture this 30 percent as a merger arb trader i mean you'd obviously love to and sometimes there are merger arbitrage traders who will invest in stocks that they think are likely to be targets in future mergers but of course that's a much riskier trade the true merger arbitrage traders are just stepping in after this big price rise and they're not trying to capture this 30 percent move they're trying to capture this last two or three percent return and now that doesn't seem probably like a very high return to you but it there's a high probability of getting that it also might close in we'll say three months so a two percent return over three months annualizes out to a better return and in addition because the stock as you can see here it's way less volatile after it has made this jump it's lower volatility and so it might be reasonable for a merger arbitrage trader to leverage into this trade so to, to use borrowed money to do this trade and maybe make more than two or three percent over their holding period and so that is um that is the idea behind merger arbitrage and um, the spread is basically the return to investing in the deal so we talk about merger arbitrage spreads and that is the wideness of the spread relates to the return that you would earn uh, if you invested in this deal and so if a deal breaks losses can be of around 25 percent on a single position right so we'll say if, if on our prior example where we said uh, that the stock price uh, went close to a hundred dollars a share well if the deal broke it might fall by 25 percent sometimes it might even fall more than that depending on the reason for the deal break and so a lot of the reason you would uh, the reason that people sell to merger are arbitrage traders is that a lot of we'll say long only investors might have bought this stock uh, months or years ago and they actually earned that 30 percent uh, spike when when the the deal was announced and at this point they don't really know that much about it. They're, they're not really good at assessing the probability of the deal closing and rather than hold on for this extra small spread they would rather sell it to a merger arbitrage trader and just insure themselves against the risk of the deal breaking so what really happens here is almost that in order to get the deal done, if you think about it, the shareholders need to vote that they want the deal done. There's a bunch of things that might happen. And then the shares even have to be collected together. And in a way, a merger arbitrage trader is kind of providing a service to the market where they collect the shares up from a whole bunch of individual shareholders. And then they'll probably vote in order to get the deal done in order to uh, in order to be able to exit this trade profitably so that is sort of the work of a merger arbitrage trader now they're only going to invest if they think the deal is likely to close so the and the more likely they think the deal is to close the tighter the spread will be and so they have to feel that the spread is compensating them for the risk that they're taking and uh, and that it's an attractive deal now the spreads don't always an interesting thing is sometimes we'll say if a merger is announced and we'll say we'll go back to our example where a hundred dollars a share is being offered you might see 
the price of uh, the target company actually jump maybe to 102 or 105 and you might say well why would it go above the terms of the deal because if you bought it now at 102 and have to hand it in at 100 in a few months time that's a you've locked in a guaranteed loss now the reason that that would happen that it would go through the terms of the merger is actually that the merger arbitrage traders think that the price is not good enough and that maybe another company might come in and make a higher offer and that does sometimes happen when one company says they want to buy another company another competitor in the space might look at it and say well that's way too good a deal and now they'll have way bigger market share than us if they get that deal done and so that company might compete and come in and offer we'll say 105 for the shares so there's two types of deal that we'll talk about today we'll talk about cash deals and then we'll talk about shares deals and it's basically that the buyer of in the merger is able to buy by either paying cash for the shares that are outstanding of the target company or they could exchange some of their shares for the shares of the target company so the easiest one to understand and the first one we'll talk about is a cash deal and that's when the offer is made to buy the shares in cash so that's like the example I just gave where they say we'll buy those shares for a hundred dollars a share now Traders will then just go out and buy the target shares after the announcement and hold until deal completion, at which point they expect to receive $100 for share. Uh, if the deal does complete, they'll receive cash at closure. So they'll turn in their shares that maybe they bought for $98 a share. They'll turn them in and get $100 a share for those shares. So the arbitrage spread is equal to 100 times the offer price minus the current target price divided by the current target price. So that would be 100 times, uh, we'll say if it was $100 a share, minus if it's trading at 98 now, minus 98, so that's a two over 98. And that will give you the, the gross arbitrage spread. That is the percentage return that the trader is expecting to earn. And so the return is the gross spread plus the target dividends and so we always have to look at dividends as well because if a dividend will be paid before the merger happens obviously if you own the target company shares you will receive that dividend so that's uh that's how a merger arbitrage spread on a cash deal is calculated now a share to share deal is when the buying company the acquirer says that they will pay We'll say, for example, company A agrees to acquire company B for 0 0.6 shares of company A. So they're saying that for every share of company B that's out there, we will give you 0 0.6 of a share of our shares. And so that is a fixed ratio stock deal. And obviously that's a little bit more complicated than a cash deal. We have to think a little bit more about that. So. A risk arbitrage trader will buy company B stock and they'll sell company A stock short on a ratio. Okay, so in this position, you own the target company stock just like the last time, but you now short the stock of the acquirer. So let's see how that will work out. So if you buy company B stock and sell short company A stock on a ratio and the ratio is of course driven by that 0 0.6 shares per share and so for every share of company b that you buy you'll be selling short 0 0.6 shares of company a and then at completion the company b shares will be converted into 0 0.6 shares of company a which will automatically cover that short so you don't really need to do anything at the end the shares that you um, the shares that you own get converted into the shares that you have borrowed and shorted and so then you're able to just one offsets the other and you have no position anymore and you've captured the spread and so the profit on this trade will equal the amount of the spread and so 
The spread, of course, in this type of scenario, it doesn't just go exactly sideways, maybe as I, I insinuated earlier. The spread will widen and narrow. So if we look at this and see this as the spread, what we'll, we'll see happening is that if there's good news that indicates that the merger is likely to close, the spread will narrow. And if there is bad news that indicates that maybe the deal will break, the spread will widen. And so the spread will be widening and narrowing uh, throughout the uh, life of the deal until completion. And so a lot of merger arbitrage traders will be assessing all of this news, understanding what's going on, and they might be adding or reducing their position based upon this news. And of course, their ads and cuts will be widening and narrowing the spread, but equally some of them might disagree with the market's point of view. So we'll say on this dip, where there was some bad news and the spread widened. Um, a trader who thinks, well, that's not actually such bad news might use that as an opportunity to get into the spread. So merger arbitrage risk factors. So there's a bunch of risk factors. There's a bunch of ways that this trade can go wrong and you can lose money. Um, the, we've broken it down into two groups of factors. One is deal break risks, and then we've got other factors. So under deal break risks, there's things like antitrust or regulatory risk. So essentially, we'll say if, if it's a big merger between two uh, really key companies that would possibly end up with monopoly power at the end of this merger, there is a risk that this is not allowed by uh, various legislators. So they call that antitrust rules. And so should the deal be disallowed by regulation, the deal will break and of course the spread will widen. Um, any conditions to closing. So there can be legal conditions put in place to the closing of the deal, and that might cause the deal to break as well. Financing risk. So if, uh, if the buying company, if the acquirer needs to finance this, this deal, they might need to issue bonds or issue additional equity in order to do this purchase. And if they are unable to do that, then the deal might break. And then we've got litigation risk where there can be lawsuits that will prevent the deal from closing. So they are a bunch of uh, deal break risks that exist. Then we've got other factors like the time to completion. And so the time to completion can actually turn a winning trade into a losing trade for a merger arbitrage trader. And the reason for that is that we'll say, for example, if the spread looks like getting you an annualized return of uh, 6%, but you've got a certain cost of capital, right? So as, a, as a, a hedge fund or as a trader, you often have a cost of capital, especially if you're using borrowed money to do this trade. And so we'll say if that deal that was supposed to close in three months ends up taking a year to close, well, then suddenly your annualized return is much lower and basically what's happening is that maybe your cost of capital is actually higher than the uh, the return on the spread and so your winning trade has turned into a losing trade even though the deal does eventually close. Um, other things are things like dividends being paid. So what if, well, actually, if a, if a deal is extended, maybe more dividends get paid. But even just what if a dividend cut is announced by the, uh, by the uh, target company, that will affect your profitability as well. Things like earnings misses can be problematic. Uh, liquidity in the trade, so often it can be difficult uh, buying and selling, and that can, uh, that can be a risk factor. In particular, if a deal breaks, liquidity is a real problem because you might wish to get out of that position, but everyone is selling at the same time as you, so there are essentially no buyers for a certain uh, amount of the move. Um, and so, therefore, of course, a more liquid underlying is probably more attractive than a less liquid one. So if, if the target company is thinly traded to begin with, that is a, a risk that, uh, that a, a merger arbitrage trader will have to take into account. Uh, the ability to borrow the acquirer shares. So if, if you're going to be doing a, a merger arb on a, uh, on a stock deal, if you're gonna trade this, and it's very difficult to borrow 
the shares of the acquirer, um, it, it can be difficult to do this trade. Now, of course, whenever you're shorting a stock, you usually have to, you, you can't just, a lot of people misunderstand the idea of shorting a stock and they think that you just hit the sell button in your brokerage software, but that's not how it works, simply because um, when you're selling something short, if you've sold it, you've sold it to someone who expects you to deliver the shares. So actually, in order to sell something short, you have to borrow the shares from someone, usually from your broker, and then you short them, and then uh, then you eventually return them to the person you borrowed. And they don't lend them to you for free. You usually have to pay some sort of an interest rate. And so if it's difficult to borrow the shares, that means that the interest rate, the cost of borrow is quite high. And so if the cost of borrow is quite high, that will eat into your profits as well. And then just things like market or sector performance. Often, if mergers are announced in a given sector that then has very bad news, often the deals will break because the acquirer might decide that they no longer wish to do the acquisition. And so that often happens in a big stock sell-off as well. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But if the market falls a lot, or if the given sector falls a lot, what can happen is, that it, uh, it becomes unattractive to the buyer to buy at the price they agreed to buy. And so they might try and find a way of getting out of the deal. And of course that will cause losses for a merger arbitrage trader. So then we move on to risk management. So within a merger arbitrage deal book, um, you, you often are risking losing a million dollars in order to make a hundred thousand dollars. So often the losses on an individual trade can be significantly greater, as you can imagine, than the expected return is. And so deal break risk is a big deal for, um, for merger arbitrage traders. And so one of the things they'll try and do is firstly, I guess, understand the deals they're in as well as possible in order to minimize the risk. But also, um, they will aim to control the risk through diversification. Now, that doesn't mean owning a diversified uh, stock portfolio. It means that they'll try and be in a lot of deals all at once. So often, there's a lot of deals. There's a lot of mergers and acquisition activity. And these traders will try to have... Um, a bunch of these deals in their portfolio rather than just one or two. And hopefully that way, if one of the deals breaks, while they will lose a, a good amount of money on it, they won't have had all their eggs in that one basket. And so hopefully the overall portfolio will do well. Um, Deal breaks can, unfortunately, be highly correlated. And as I said before, it's often when the market falls a lot that deals break. And so often you'll, you'll see that the returns on merger arbitrage tend to look a lot like the returns of being short an S&P 500 put. They, they tend to slightly outperform that, but that is roughly what the return stream is. And so... Um, that is kind of what the returns on merger arbitrage look like. So um, like any economic proposition, when there are excess returns to be earned, more people will come in. So once again, this is the kind of strategy that can suffer from overcrowding because there's only so many deals and thus there's only so much room for people. There's only so much money that can be put to work in this space. And so, Merger arbitrations are often a little bit low because they're fairly safe returns. An awful lot of these deals close. The majority, around I think 98% of the deals do close. But the problem is that that attracts an awful lot of people. And in particular, in a, in a good merger environment, more and more money comes into the space. And then of course the expected return falls. And so um, while the returns are reasonably safe in a good environment, the problem is that they're often a little bit low. And in in particular after a big boom because it just attracts either more and more money into the existing funds or new funds are launched and more and more people are chasing the same deals. So this is the HFRX ED uh, index. Uh, this is a, a screen grab from the Financial Times. 
and this is five years of returns of merger arbitrage and as you can see there at uh, the last five years have not been great for this strategy it's really been sort of sideways to slightly down uh, with kind of plenty of volatility in there so it hasn't been a great period for for the returns of this strategy um, this i'm shooting this video in march uh, 2020 and so uh, the market has fallen significantly because of the whole coronavirus uh, lockdown and we haven't yet seen uh, march's returns and so it'll be interesting to see how they look and to see if how things have held up over this big fall that has occurred in in markets um, Returns in the longer term, this is the HF4X ED from 97 through to around 2015. And the heavy blue line is the return of the, the merger arbitrage index. And so as you can see, it's had reasonably steady returns. It actually did all right through, um, through the dot-com sell-off and through the uh, financial crisis, which is pretty good and in all honesty, better than would be expected. Because as I said, the returns on this strategy uh, often mimic being short an S&P put. Uh, but as you can see, it's also underperformed the S&P 500, uh, but equally with lower volatility. So hopefully you can see that maybe in the very long run, this is an attractive uh, hedge fund strategy, as long as uh, you're in it for a good period, I suppose. So now we'll move on to our next idea, which is statistical arbitrage. And so the idea of statistical arbitrage is if there's a bet where you have a win that is equal to your loss, so we've got wins of one and losses of minus one, and if you have a greater than 50% probability of winning, uh, the trade, we call that statistical arbitrage. Now that's not an arbitrage in the traditional sense in that uh, it's not a risk-free return, but if you have this greater than 50% win rate and the wins are equal to the losses, what happens is that over the long run, the returns start to look like arbitrages, in particular if you can do this trade reasonably frequently. So an example of this is the operations of a casino, right? Because all of the games within a casino, there is a win rate that is greater than the loss rate on the trades and often are on the trades on the games and often the uh, wins and losses are roughly equivalent to each other and so a casino would be doing what we consider a statistical arbitrage trade and there's a bunch of uh, trades in the market that people call statistical arbitrage that hopefully look a little bit like that now they don't always because in markets the win rate varies significantly so you can't uh, you can't be sure if you have a greater than 50 percent win rate and equally you can't be sure that your wins will be greater than your losses so there's much more risk in the market than there is in in something like a casino game um, so a bunch of the trades that we're about to look at now are fall under that classification of statistical arbitrage um, as i've said they're not they're not perfect trades by any means but they are an approach to trading that a lot of people follow and that are widely followed at hedge funds. Okay, so the first one that we're going to look at is what's called pairs trading, which is when it's called pairs trading because there's a pair of stocks and you're usually long one and short another. And so the example we'll start with is Home Depot and Lowe's, which are two large hardware stores in the United States. They sell lumber and sort of home repair goods. And um, they have very similar business models. In truth, when I go into a Home Depot or a Lowe's, I don't know which of the two I'm in, except that usually Home Depot has sort of orange branding and Lowe's has blue branding, but the stores are really almost identical. Um, they have very similar market caps, so they're similarly sized stores or sized companies, and they operate in the same country, the United States, and they're competing for the very same kind of consumer base. So they're very similar companies, and so you could imagine that anything that is good for Home Depot is good for Lowe's, and anything that is bad for Home Depot is bad for Lowe's. And so you would hope that maybe the prices might go up and down together based on the economic factors that they're exposed to. 
Now, just because that happens doesn't mean that there's not company specific risk, right? Because even though they're both exposed to the same economic factors, maybe uh, something might go right or wrong at one of the companies that doesn't occur at the other. So there will be maybe a strong relationship between their stock prices, but there's no good reason to expect them to be perfectly correlated with each other, or there's no reason to think that they shouldn't diverge from each other at some point in the future. And so if we look at the correlation coefficient between Home Depot and Lowe's, it's usually between 0.95 and 97. And so this is actually just a rolling correlation graph that we've pulled from Bloomberg. And at the low, it's 0.9595. So that's actually almost 96% correlated. And it goes as high as 0.9773, so almost 0.98 correlation. So there's very high correlation between this pair of stocks. Now, we're using correlation in order to seek out a, a pair. In truth, when you're trading this kind of strategy, you'll use co-integration rather than correlation. But this isn't a statistics class, so I'll allow you. If you're really interested in that, you can look up the difference between correlation and co-integration. But in order to find a pair, correlation is quite reasonable. And so we've got Home Depot and Lowe's. And essentially what you would do is you would work out the price relationship between the two of them. And then you would wait for them to diverge. And then you would buy the cheap one, sell the expensive one, and exit the position when the relationship reverts. So essentially as the spread widens, you would be putting on a trade. And then once the spread narrows again, you would exit that trade at a profit. Now, in a trade like this, there'll usually be a stop in there as well, a stop loss. And I have another video up on order types if you don't know what a stop order is. But um, there'll, there'll usually be a stop loss in there in this type of trade. And I often say that stops don't always make sense for traders. I've explained that in another video. But, um, but the stop is needed here simply because maybe sometimes the spread widens, you put on a trade and then it widens further and maybe you even increase your size in that trade depending on sort of how you've back tested it or your approach. But there is a point in the widening at which maybe it's unlikely for it to narrow again because sometimes the widening might be for a very good reason. So this is sort of the risk that exists in this pairs trading strategy. Now, by the way, I'm not suggesting how you might trade it. I'm just saying that these are approaches that people do or might take to this type of trading strategy. Okay, so we'll look firstly at a profitable example of this type of trade. So we've just sort of thrown together some lines here that, that represent the stock prices of a highly correlated or co-integrated pair. And what we're going to be doing here is that when the spread widens by a certain amount, you're going to be selling the expensive one and buying the cheap one. So in this example, we've got um, the, I, I guess the, the blue line has gone up. And so we're going to be selling that uh, company's shares short. We'll be going long the orange company's shares. And then when they narrow out again, we exit at a profit when, when the two uh, pairs move back into line with each other. So that would be the goal of a, a, a trader like this. And then obviously they would just hope that these types of spreads widen and narrow a lot over their trading career. And they get to do this type of trade over and over again and hopefully generate profits. And so that would be the, the ideal scenario for someone trading um, a pair like this. Now, the next example here, we've got the spread widens in the same way, uh, but in this case, they, they go on to have no relationship between each other. Now, what might have happened? Well, there's many things. Maybe one of them has found something fraudulent in their accounts, and so their stock has tanked. Or maybe one of them has decided to buy out the other, for example. And so one of them has gone way up in price, and the other has gone down in price. And there's no reason to think that that is not a permanent situation. And so there are many events that could happen that would cause uh, the spread to widen and possibly never narrow again. And that is why a trader in uh, doing this kind of pairs trading strategy will usually have some sort of stop loss in place. And it's to 
get them out of the trade in a scenario like this because you know the problem with this kind of trade is that maybe you can make a little bit of money a lot of the time and then once in a while you might have just a huge loss that wipes out uh, maybe months or a year or more of your returns and so that's often the problem with strategies like this is that they tend to have uh, that kind of a payoff profile. As you can see with this type of strategy, if a trader is actually doing this, if you invest in a hedge fund that does this type of trade, uh, the trading decisions are unrelated to the level of the market, right? If the market is going up or the market is going down, it really says nothing about whether these spreads are widening or narrowing. So you would expect if you're investing in a strategy like this to be getting alpha rather than beta. You'd be expecting to get a return that's unrelated to the return of the market. Um, the trading decisions are usually taken by this type of trader. It's not always, you know, everyone will do it differently, but often the trading decisions are unrelated to the fundamentals of the stock. So they're not building a DCF model to work out what a, a, a fair uh, price discrepancy is between these two stocks. They're actually just doing it based on the historical relationship between the two positions. So um, here is a graph of the Home Depot lows uh, spread. So here we have just the spread widening and narrowing. And as you can see here, it sometimes uh, widens in one direction, sometimes in another direction. And so depending on the trader's risk tolerance, they will decide how much they need it to widen in order to put on a trade and then how much they wait for it to narrow. Because for example, they might have put on a trade here and made a profit when it narrowed, or, or they might have waited and only done one trade in this entire period when it got really quite wide at this point. But as you can see, it widens and narrows and a trader will build some sort of statistical model to analyze how to get the best risk adjusted return out of trading a spread like this. And so this is a daily price graph of the spread between Home Depot and Lowe's. And so this might be appropriate to a trader who only wants to put on a trade every day or two, or maybe, you know, in truth, they might only be trading once a week based upon the daily data that we're seeing right here, maybe less than once a week. Um, equally, we're able to move to, uh, to, to a much more short-term version. Sorry, I thought I had a slide on that. Um, I, I don't. But uh, maybe they, they could trade on a much more short-term short version where you look at the hourly or the minute-by-minute -minute spread widening and narrowing. And so there are some traders who might be putting in hundreds of trades based upon this spread on a daily basis. And there are other traders who might be trading once a month or once a week or once a day based upon uh, this, this spread. And so there's many different ways of doing this. And so there's no real reason even to expect two traders who are trading this type of strategy to be hugely correlated to each other, except if they've done identical analysis and decided on an identical holding period. It's also worth noting that for the very high frequency version of this type of trading strategy, it'll be done using computer execution because it'll be too fast maybe for a, for a manual trader to, to be able to execute the trades. And so why might the valuations diverge? Well, there's, there's many reasons for that. Things like the quality of management, like maybe one company is being just run much better than the other company over time. And so maybe there's just a, a creeping widening of the spread, for example, um, that, that is due to one company just being better than the other. Maybe there's a different investor base. For example, maybe an activist investor got involved in one of the two companies and is agitating for change. And that might be pushing up or down the price. Um, there might be different leverage levels, so they, they might have quite different capital structures to each other. Uh, they might make very different strategic decisions as to how to grow, and so they might, we'll say, maybe uh, one of maybe Home Depot decides to concentrate more on hardware, and Lowe's decides to concentrate more on lumber, for example, and so over time they might diverge. Um, takeover 
risk. I mentioned that earlier that maybe it's announced that one company is being bought out and the other is not. And so a spread might widen up rather significantly there. And so it's very important in this type of trading strategy not to be too insistent that the statistical relationships hold. You know, just because they held in the past doesn't mean they're guaranteed to, or it doesn't mean they have to hold in the future. These are things that hold because they hold, but there's, a, you know, there's, there's not necessarily a, a, a requirement that they always hold. It, it, I have an architect friend who talks about, uh, you know, uh, she was once looking at a kind of a, a house that was maybe badly engineered and, and she referred to it as you know she says that you would expect a house that was built in that manner to fall down but sometimes houses just stay up due to habit and so sometimes these spreads just uh, you know they maintain their relationship more due to habit than uh, than anything else and there's no real requirement that they actually hold so a trader has to realize this a trader who thinks that they are required to hold is going to be taking maybe inappropriate risk in this in this type of situation and so that's it really on statistical arbitrage in equities um, the basis is the historical statistical relationship between a pair. It anticipates that that relationship will continue and it anticipates that aberrations in price relationships revert. So that's the, the core idea behind that trading strategy. So the next thing we're going to talk about are share class trades and share class trades are another type of pair trade. So we're not necessarily done with pairs trades. We're just moving to a different type of them. So before with Home Depot on Lowe's, we just found two companies in the same business that are have a strong relationship maybe between them. In share classes, it might often be one company. So there's just one company and it has multiple share classes. And so traders will try and do these types of trading strategies on those two share classes. So for example, you might see ordinary and preferred shares. Uh, in, in Italy, there are ordinary, preferred and saver shares. There's often things like class A and class B shares. And there will be sometimes differences between, in fact, there usually are differences between these different share classes. Um, but nonetheless, because they're based on the one company, you would expect them to have a relationship to each other and that you're able to maybe model that relationship and work out uh, a trading strategy around that. Um, in addition, there's sometimes a local line and a foreign listing. So there's what's called American depository receipts, which is a type of share. We'll say if there's a European company and in order to attract American investors, they might package some of the shares together and list them on the New York Stock Exchange in what's known as an ADR, an American Depository Receipt. And so that will be the same shares, uh, often packaged into bigger groups. So it might, uh, an ADR might represent 20 or 50 or 100 shares of the European uh, stock. And you would imagine with the two lines of stocks, however they might be, whether they're PREF or awards or whether they're Class A, or Class B shares or ADRs and a local line of stock, um, you, because they're based on the same companies and the same cash flows, uh, you would expect that good news would move both of them up, bad news would move both of them down. And there, there should be a reasonably tight relationship between the two. And so once again, people trade these pairs. So the first one we'll talk about here is dual listed companies. So uh, a dual listed company is often a company where there's 40% ownership of the company listed in one company and the remaining 60% is listed in another country. And so there are fundamental factors and risks such as currency, governance structures, legal contracts, liquidity, um, taxes. And there's, there's lots of things that might mean that they uh, trade slightly different to each other. There might be a, a reason that one is more attractive than the other two investors. Um, but there still might be arbitrage type opportunities available in the market around these. Uh, but it's also worth noting that anomalies can and do sometimes persist. And our, our final slide in this class is sort of a, a rather shocking uh, example of that. Okay, so we'll firstly look at the 
the Royal Dutch Shell example. So Shell and Royal Dutch, well, it's, it's one company, but it used to have dual listing. So it was listed in both Amsterdam and in London. They're class A, class B shares trading in three different countries. So the Netherlands, Britain and New York with six listings in total. So as you can imagine, this was an example of the sort of type of, uh, of uh, share class that people liked to trade. Um, there were differences in dividends, difference in tax, and, uh, and there were many different uh, differences between the different listings. But nonetheless, it was the one underlying company. And so people liked to trade one against the other. And in fact, I believe long term capital management that we mentioned in yesterday's class, one of their big trades was to trade Royal Dutch Shell as well. Um, here we have a bunch of pairs, uh, you know, uh, Europe's most arbitrage. These were kind of the biggest uh, arbitrage uh, companies, the sort of dual listings that existed. But there are dozens more. There's just a ton of these, and in particular in Europe, because there tends to be, uh, you know, more of this in, in European exchanges. So firstly, let's talk about why they don't typically uh, trade at identical share price, like why there's even any opportunity at all. There's often different voting rights different dividend entitlements, different liquidity, or even just different investor bases because of the above things. And by investor bases, I mean that there are some investors who might like to invest in, uh, in uh, stocks that only trade in the United States or maybe stocks that do or don't pay dividends. There's many kind of different types of investor bases. And so they might be attracted to one share class rather than the other. And so they rarely trade at very close prices, but often there will be a tight relationship between these different uh, share class pairs. Um, it's possible to, uh, to trade these share classes in as varied a time period as possible. In fact, this was, I think we're coming to the slide that I thought I was coming to a while ago. And so you can do very short term trades or very long term trades on these pairs. Um, the very low frequency ones will sometimes be manually executed. Now, I would argue that this type of trading strategy probably should never be manually executed, but that's because I come from a quantitative background where I like uh, everything to be coded up. But, um, but sometimes they're manually traded by traders who, who don't know how to uh, do things in a more quantitative manner. And so here we have one of the spreads, uh, a, a share class spread uh, put together um, and we're looking at daily data here. So th this is the example I was expecting to find earlier. So this is the daily spread. And so as you can imagine, you can be getting in and out of this at various holding periods uh, and you can decide at what sensitivity you require the spreads to widen before you, you put on a trade. And maybe if it widens more, you might increase your size. And then when it closes, you exit. There's many ways that you can do this. And it all depends on your risk tolerance and it will depend on the quality of your back test. And I would say usually the type of person who's trading this stuff does it based upon a pretty decent statistical back test and not just a seat of the pants kind of thing. But there are people who do it in a seat of the pants way as well. Um, this is the same share class pair, uh, just in daily data. So as you can imagine, a higher frequency, a, a quantitative trader with a computer program to set up might be trading it all in and out intraday rather than with close of day prices or however it might be done by a slower trader. And so basically there are many people who might be trading the same spreads and they're just doing them in different ways based on either their differing ability or their different risk types tolerances. So um, share class rationalization is another type of trade in here that a lot of people do and did. Now I'm not crazy about this trade, but it's a thing that some people like. A lot of this was driven by, I think it was SAP, a big German company that many years ago collapsed their share prices. And I think there was a spread of around, or collapsed their share classes. And there might have been, there were two share classes and I think the spread was roughly around 20% or so. And so certain people did this trade. They, they just bet on uh, one being converted into the other and that 
did happen with SAP and a big return was earned and then of course that attracted a lot of people who started doing it in a lot of different uh, share classes but there's just a general or there was a general trend towards collapsing different share classes and it's essentially due to this sort of corporate governance idea it's considered weak corporate governance to have a whole bunch of different share classes out there maybe with different voting rights and so on so you often saw this in European companies where it might have been a family company and they listed it and they sort of held on to a lot of the voting rights in the shares that the family got and the shares that were exchange listed were um, you know similar but didn't have the same voting rights and so uh, there, there was a trend towards improved corporate governance and getting rid of these multiple share classes now often there were uh, share class differentials of around 20 percent and collapsing the share class spreads might provide a big return for a trader and so there were and there i guess still are a lot of hedge funds who trade this type of strategy and so there's a bunch of pairs out here um, this is a slide I put together many years ago and then, uh, you know, that listed what the spreads were. And then over time, they, uh, they converged or they converted. So they collapsed the, the spreads. And so we've got, um, you know, Casino, Buzzy, Volkswagen, Telecom, Italia. I won't read the list out to you, but there's a whole bunch of them. And they're varying spreads and people try and profit based upon that. And so um, the long term hold of some of these, this is Italia Cementi, the Italian cement company. And as you can see, a long term hold of that was kind of generating profits as, as the, that's the spread narrowing. And so you were generating profits uh, based upon that, just on this idea that eventually they'd convert one into the other. Um, but then here's another example, a share class index, uh, where uh, the spread was narrowing and then widened, right? And, and the truth is, there's no real economic necessity. Like while you might think that, it, that there might be a trend towards this and it might be a nice thing to happen, there's no real reason to expect it to actually happen. Just because you want it to happen doesn't mean it will. And so once again, this is a trade that people can do. I, I would slightly argue that you're exposing yourself to a lot of randomness, but you know, people enjoy that. So, um, so anyhow, uh, it can go right, it can go wrong. Um, now here's an example of it really going wrong and this is the Volkswagen spread and this was uh, this happened back in 2008 and it actually happened shortly after the Lehman Brothers uh, meltdown and interestingly enough I would say that this spread probably caused more damage to hedge funds than the financial crisis did and we'll see why so um, Volkswagen was one of these share class spreads where the spread was actually typically wider. And I remember there was a guy I knew who used to say, you should put all of your net worth, you should mortgage your house and put it into trading the Volkswagen spread. Luckily, I didn't. Um, but anyhow, the, the spread was often a 50% premium while others are around the 20% range. So it was quite a wide spread. And so a lot of people felt that it was reasonable to expect this thing to narrow. So what happened was there's a long history and I won't go into it between the Porsche family and Volkswagen. In fact, you know, Ferdinand Porsche founded Volkswagen, then uh, went on to found Porsche and the Porsche family always have uh, had stakes in both of these two companies. And th there was a long story of uh, disagreements between the family members and so on. But anyhow, I won't I won't tell you the soap opera version. Porsche began buying up a stake in Volkswagen through the ordinary shares. So they started buying the ordinary shares. Now, what was happening was that, that Porsche thought that they could buy out Volkswagen, and, um, but they, they weren't allowed to, I think, until they had more than an 80% stake. Now, the problem was that um, Lower Saxony, where, where Volkswagen was owned 20% of the shares. So there was no way of Porsche really being able to sort of seize control of Volkswagen. But anyhow, they started buying up shares and they, you know this went on for a while. And then they ended up taking a large position using uh, cash settled options, right? Because they weren't, they weren't required to say 
what their ownership stake was until they actually owned the stocks. And if you own an option, you own a derivative. You don't actually own the underlying stock. So once these options, um, once these options were exercised, then uh, Porsche would, would state what their ownership state, uh, stake was in Volkswagen. So anyhow, um, it turned out that Volkswagen controlled around 71.4%. I think towards the end of this trade, like when, when things started going crazy, they actually owned up and said how much they controlled through either their ownership of stock combined with the, the cash settled options that they owned. And so Volkswagen controlled about 71.4% of the float of the shares outstanding and Lower Saxony, as I mentioned earlier, owned 20%. Now, what that meant was that there were a bunch of people with this spread on where they were a long one and short the other. But the thing they were short, the ordinary shares that they were short, because the ordinaries were going up and up as Porsche was taking these options positions. And what was happening was, of course, as I explained earlier, when you want to short something, you have to borrow the shares in order to short them. And the problem was that very soon, as soon as Volkswagen exercised their options, they would have 71.4% of the shares. They might not lend them to you. Lower Saxony at 20%. So how many shares were available out in the world? Well, not many. What is that around, uh, gosh, uh, what is that, around 6% or something like that? Um, so less than 6%. So, wait, no, I think that was, there's an error in my slot. That's meant to say 74.1%. That's why I'm confused by the percentage. Sorry, I'll correct that. Um, but anyhow, uh, through a combination of risk assets been sold off. So this was during the financial crisis. There was a lot going on. And this short squeeze from the Volkswagen Ords being purchased by Porsche, the spread blew out to previously unimaginable level. So there were huge, huge losses associated with this. A lot of hedge funds and prop desks lost huge sums of money just from this one trade. And this is a trade that they might have had on in the kind of size where they were hoping to maybe make, I don't know, like a million dollars a year off of, and instead they might have lost a billion. So let's see it. So this is, I, I took this from the Financial Times. Um, this is the Volkswagen share price. So as you can see, it kind of went up, down a little bit, and then it just exploded. And so for a short time, uh, back in 2008, Volkswagen was the largest company in the world by market cap. And it was just this huge, huge short squeeze in, uh, in the ordinary shares. And so uh, it was worth 420 billion, which was more than ExxonMobil, PetroChina, Microsoft, all of the big companies that you can think of, uh, Volkswagen, biggest company in the world. Um, it wouldn't have been uncommon for a hedge fund or a prop desk to have had a position of 50 million pounds per side on. Like that was the kind of size that people would have put on a sort of a moderate trade in this space. Uh, when the spread went from 70% uh, in 2007, there would have been losses of basically close to a billion pounds on a 50 million pound position, right? So as you can see here, huge, huge losses. Um, if you were, mo most people would have just been stopped out. There was, there was no way of holding on to this, like just the margin and everything on it. Like it, this wasn't a trade that you were going to hold on to. I mean, if you had been able to, if you're well capitalized enough to hold on to this, um, it did eventually revert, uh, but uh, but you know the the losses were just huge on this trade. I I think there was a at the time it was even in the newspaper that a German businessman who used to trade this. I think he tr threw himself under a train. He was so depressed from. I think he lost his entire fortune just trading this spread. And so at the bottom here we've got the line: markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. That's a quote of John Maynard Keynes. And of course, that is a very clear example of it here in the Volkswagen spread. And so um, that's the last slide in my, my hedge funds uh, part two class. And so um, we'll just return to the idea of hedge funds. So 
hedge funds, what are they? Well, they are usually investment partnerships where uh, people invest. Usually they're investing in order to get diversification benefit. They're trying to get a return that's not available by just trading stocks, for example. Um, they're looking for uncorrelated returns. So something that might be that return might be unrelated to movements in uh, traditional markets or traditional asset classes. Often the strategies are complex and so this video and yesterday's video we've gone through a bunch of trading strategies and as you can see they're more complex than just sort of analyzing the stocks that you think are good and buying them. Um, there are usually higher fees than long only investments and kind of significantly higher you know if you invest in the Vanguard index fund I think the I think they charge possibly less than five basis points while you know a hedge fund it's 200 basis points or two percent plus 20 percent of the upside so usually these are you know as i said more complicated and maybe dif more difficult to execute strategies but the fees are significantly higher and so that's equally what attracts people to this space is that if you are able to run a strategy like this reasonably well you can maybe make quite a good living off of doing so Often these strategies and these funds are exposed to unusual risks and I, I worry that I, I look back on my two days of classes and I've highlighted a number of disasters and not of course the many things that have gone well in this space and the good returns but maybe I feel there's just more to learn by looking at how things go wrong and how things go right. We, we can all imagine how things can go well. It's worth highlighting things going wrong but um you know, often these funds are exposed to unusual risks and so it can be surprising like in the Volkswagen spread there it might have been surprising to see how quickly someone lost so much money trading a strategy like that that might have uh, when it was pitched to you sounded reasonably safe and sensible uh, these are hedge funds are not suitable for all investors and in fact I would argue they're probably not suitable for most investors and it's probably worthwhile pointing out that in order for someone to invest in a hedge fund they should probably probably be able to have some sort of understanding as to what's going on like what the strategy is and why it should make money and so for that reason uh, usually uh, investments in hedge funds are not available to the public they're set aside for what are called in the United States accredited investors and they're essentially people that are wealthy enough that the SEC or the regulators don't really worry about them losing money. They sort of, you know, what regulators are worried about regular people losing their retirement funds and not being able to retire. They're not really worried if a billionaire puts 100 million into a hedge fund and loses 100 million. And so that's often who these strategies are for. They're for institutional investors that can understand them and that are able to understand the risks that are being taken. Or they're for very high net worth individuals who once again even if they lose everything in these funds they should still be able to uh, have enough remaining wealth to to do just fine so anyhow that is hedge funds hopefully you found this interesting and informative and i will see you later bye